Welcome to Business Coaching Secrets with Carl Bryan. If you want to attract new high-end coaching clients, fill live events, and build a wildly profitable coaching practice where business owners pay, stay, and refer, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, Carl provides his keys to the kingdom for finding and signing high-paying clients and building the coaching business of your dreams. Here we go. Hey everybody, and welcome to Business Coaching Secrets with your boy Road Dog here and the man himself, Mr. Carl Bryan. Welcome back, sir. Yo ho ho, Road Dog. What's happening, my man? What is going on? Just uh, living the quarantine life, my friend. That's uh, <laughs> Actually, but hang on, man. You're living the quarantine life, but on the weekend, we got some special news. I would like for you to tell everybody, what did you get up to on the weekend? Let's hear it. Oh, not much. Just went out for a little 26.2 mile run. <laughs> so, hang on. So, before we, I want everybody to understand what happened. So, nuts and bolts, guys. We're living in some crazy times right now, right? Coronavirus on steroids, to do, to do, to do. Um, uncertain times, unsettling times. But a boy road dog has been training for a number of weeks, in fact, a number of months, to do a um, to do a marathon. It was supposed to be in the USA. We are in Canada. They're not letting us in the country at the moment, right? Nothing serious, but nothing like uh, some crazy time. So, anyways, he can't. So the, the race was canceled. The marathon was canceled. We can't even get into the country, anyways. So my boy road dog has decided to take it upon himself, set himself up a track. Nobody cheering nobody watching apart from at the finish line his wife and kids waiting for him with a legend and uh he ran only 26.2 miles you crazy son of a you know what but well done brother that is crazy and tell the group man tell us how you feel bud well i feel pretty good it's um again it's interesting because for me it's something that i swore i would never do i've run half marathons before and i was like i will never run a full marathon but here we are. It's amazing how the mindset can uh, can shift and with the right right training, right? And, and I got to say that the hardest part for me, it wasn't even the race itself as crazy as that sounds. It was when I got the email probably about two weeks ago that said the race is canceled. Um, that was such a big mental letdown and just sort of a, now what the heck do I do, right? Like, do I... You know, it's like you've, you've worked so hard. It's no different than when I think of the Olympians that have been training so hard for the Summer Olympics. And oh. they've, they've been training for four years, dude. Like, I'm just a ham and egger that's trained for 18 weeks. But these guys have been training for four years. And now this may get either postponed if they're lucky or canceled all altogether. I know. Oh, man, it's heartbreaking, dude. Ham and egger, by the way. I like that, dude. I'm going to steal that one. I'm going to call you ham and egger from now on. I think everybody will like that. But that's cool. So, but I want to talk about the psychology because, again, guys, on settling times, some crazy times. So, like, with I want you to walk us through. So, it's eight. What was it? Eighteen weeks of training. Is that right? That's and right. That was yeah. laid out. That's not something you made up. Like, this is something you followed. Correct. Correct. Yep. And at no time did you ever run twenty six point two miles. Correct. The, the training is about starting. No doubt. You know, significantly short. Significantly shorter than that. But then ramping it up. Ramping it up but you never even got close to 26.2 miles. That was just on race day, correct? Yeah, so any any marathoner will know. So when you're doing a training, like the, the furthest I ran was 20. Um, and I can tell you when I did 20, my first thought was, how the hell am I going to run an extra six miles? But uh, yeah, so you're, you're definitely short. But again, the whole point is typically your adrenaline and everything else is flowing. You've got all the, you know, the people there to cheer you on. Um, that'll typically push you easily that extra six miles to sort of get you to the finish line. Yeah, I love it, dude. But the psychology of that, I got to tell you, and then, so like during these crazy times, it's a little bit the same. Like here's your marathon. It's going to last roughly four months because that's what they're saying, you know, with the coronavirus and everything else. You got to set yourself up. And when it's all said and done, though, I'm going to tell you, like at the end of four months, it's the work they're never going to be. We're going to talk about this a little bit, no doubt. Um, some of the questions are going to be coming through, but like you're going to set yourself up right now. And like one joint venture partner, if they have like there's accountants that have 
well, thousands of clients. Let's just say a smaller accounting firm that you could get into, build a relationship in reasonably short order. They've got 400 business owners. Well, if this guy or this gal that owns the the practice or even one of the really active accountants that just decides that, you know, they want to refer business to you and they have that power at the click of a finger. When the accountant says, look, you need to speak to somebody, people listen. And, you you know, your coaching practice, you take on 10 clients and you're pretty close to full. You take on 20 clients and you are full unless you got coaches underneath you. And so in other words, one accountant can literally fill up your coaching practice and then you lose a client, you lose two. And trust me, that happens to me. It happens to Road Dog. It'll happen to you. Manage your psychology. Who cares? It's just next. Um, not that you just give up. I mean, the, the goal should be to try and resurrect that relationship and keep it going. Talked about that many times during the podcast. A lot of my best coaching clients and the ones where we really knocked it out of the park were clients that at some stage were challenged in a very real and tangible way to the point where they were trying to keep, they were like, look, I got to cancel, right? I'm overwhelmed. I'm not following. I'm not showing up to the calls. I'm not this. I'm not that. Boom. Of course, I had empathy, but not sympathy, right? So again, I didn't buy into what they were saying to me. What I did is because again, I buy coaching myself and I totally, I believe in the process. I know that when you're overwhelmed, you need me more than ever, right? So I get on the horn and I convince those folks that I am the solution to their problem and that I am going to assist them and I end up resurrecting that and we end up knocking it out of the park, right? So it, again, you lose a couple clients, the accountant can just send two more, two more, line them up. Again, remember, they have 400 clients. You can only hand, 10, you know, say you know, 10 to 20. So let's go 15 at any one time, right? Boom. So so anyways, but Road Dog, let's get on with um, some Q&A here, bud, but On behalf of everybody listening, I want to say high five. The psychology of a guy who trains for a marathon, has it canceled, goes through that, and then says, you know what? Screw you. Screw everyone. I'm running the thing, and I'm doing it by myself. (laughs) No doubt doubt you would have accepted a partner, but uh, the Lord knows it wouldn't have been me. I'm built like a fire hydrant, so I'm not not designed to be running marathons, but maybe one of these days. Well, unless Um, you were like... If you want an electric scooter beside me, perhaps. perhaps. <laughs> Actually, you know, damn, that would have been a good idea, man. No, no, the no. problem is, if you guys know Carl, it's like the guy loves to talk, as clearly we have found out in this podcast. And I probably would have just turned up my music and ignored him the whole race anyways. But anyways. <laughs> We digress, but you know, it's interesting. So the, the first question, actually, this, this leads in perfectly with it, right? It's no different than me training, training, training for 16 weeks to find out it's canceled. Guess what, everybody? You've been working hard. You're working your butt off. You're gaining traction. You're gaining momentum. Because somebody asked the question, like, I was just gaining traction. And now the world gets flipped upside down, right? So there's, there's the question to you is, so what would you say to that person, Carl? Like, it's like their whole world, they've been, they've been getting this unbelievable traction in their business. Things are finally starting to click. And yep. boom, the whole world changes overnight. What do you say to that person? Yeah. Look, first of all, uh, yeah, look, great question. And no doubt there's many that, you know, stuck in this position. Here it is. And again, this to some degree, like I've, I've never done more what I'm going to call raw, raw, like just managing psychology calls than I have in the last two weeks with my, you know, you 800 coaches and 24 countries. And it's going to, it's not going to stop now. Right? This is not hyperbole. This is not anything other than reality. The biggest and most successful companies in the world were built during the toughest times. Again, you don't believe me. Just go have a look, right? You'll see it right there, plain as day. And there's never going to be a time like right now to go and get the attention of important people, both people that can sign up and pay your, say, your $2,000 a month coach, your $24,000 a year coach. No opportunity they like today to get those folks on the phone. Because believe me, they're looking at the internet. They're like, even this right now, this call, right, Road Dog, we have twice as many people as we normally have on this call. That's that's not a surprise, right? Um, so anyway, so so you, you've just got to manage that psychology and you've got to pound through. But you also have to be accepting of two things, instant gratification. You've got to be um, cautious of that. When you're reaching out to folks, do not come across, especially during these turbulent and crazy times, don't come across as though you're trying to sell them something. Don't come across as, hey, I literally had that over the weekend, to be honest with you. I'm not going to go into it. But somebody's like, 
you know, like, oh, I want to help, but I had, there's a position to be able to help me right there. In fact, I'll tell you. So looking at creating a logo for focus.com, put it up on my page, right? Somebody replies to do, to do, to do, sent them a private message and had a look at, you know, what they had. Um, and I reached out and I said, look, here's a list. If you have time, here's a list of about 200 logos that were created for me. I put the four up that I had chosen. But if you see anything else there um, that's, that you like, I would be interested. But these are the four that, you know, I ended up going with, right, which are somewhat different. But at the same time, yeah, just four logos that I wanted. Well, he then reacts that, look, we do this professionally. I'm very experienced in this. Um, if you want any help, just let me know. And I'm like, did you read the message above, bud? All you need to do is click on the link and then tell me which one and a bit of an explanation. And potentially the guy could have had a client, right? But he literally, so you, no doubt you could understand the dynamic, but it was like right there. That is not the approach that you want to take. The approach that you want to take is to help first, serve first. People are challenged and not everybody is flat broke right? Like just do understand that. Yes, there is no doubt. There are some people that are hand to mouth prior to this and now they're in a little bit of stripe and struggling, right? Do, don't put yourself in a position where you think that is everybody. Believe me, folks, you know, and there's, you know, there's assistance out there. There's this, there's that. What I'm trying to say is that believe me, people are going to be able to whip out their credit cards and they're going to continue to buy things over the next number of, you know, weeks and months. It's absolutely going to happen. But if you come across um, as trying to sell a little bit too early, that's just not going to work in your favor. End of story. So you've got to manage that. So I was saying instant gratification. Um, you know, this is not what you, you're serving first. You're helping first. But that's the way you should be doing it as a coach anyways. It's almost like, you know, you're training your client on how to be coached, right? So then you're doing it and then it's like, okay, well, now it's time to start paying. This is what I do. This is how I charge. And there will be a time to put that in front of them, which it's not like it's going to be in three months time, right? It just depends on the relationship. And I'd like to give you a black and white strategy. But on this one, um, you know, never have we seen anything quite like this. You are going to need to use your sales and spidey instincts a little bit. Um, but get out there, serve, help, support. And you will be surprised at the number of people who you can, you know, get their attention right now. So I guess I'm answering the question in that somebody is challenged. They finally get in some traction with their coach, which again, Road Dog just perfectly um, aligns with your experience with your um, marathon, like you said. And now's not the time to put your head in the sand. I, I can tell you this. I'm going to position this differently. Pain versus pleasure. If you don't do anything right now and you're not the person who reaches out and you're not the person who helps, you're not the person who sets up JVs during these crazy times, in 90 days time, you will be kicking yourself. The end. Okay, now is the time to establish some unbelievable resources. And just imagine how when you help somebody through this troubled time um, in a manner that they feel was very, I don't know, sportsmanlike is the right word, but in a very, wow, what a, we've all met that person and had that experience. We're like, that person just went above and beyond in a very real and tangible way. Like, how are you not going to refer that person in the future? How are you not going to hire that person in the future? How are you not going to maintain a relationship for a long time to come with that individual? It's just, believe me, they're going to end. Do it for 10. Don't expect 10 home runs. In fact, if you get one or two home runs, then fantastic. You might get three people take advantage of you. Unfortunately, that might be the first three. You've got to manage your psychology through all of this, but do understand that the biggest companies in the world will built during the most turbulent and economic challenge times. This is an opportunity for you to grow your coaching business and set yourself up for not only months, but like years ahead. And remember what I said, one joint venture partner with hundreds of clients can literally serve your, um, serve your coaching business for a long time to come. So that's what I'd say, man. Road dog, it comes back to managing psychology like so many things in life. So, so let me let me freestyle here. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go off the question board here just for a second because I can almost guarantee you everybody listening here um, probably has one main question as well. What about pricing right now? Like in a time like this where you said not everybody's broke, and, and I totally agree with you. Yep. Um, and again, quick side note, personal opinion. Um, you know the the people that are most scared are the people that are least prepared. 
And, and that's what you're helping them do because guess what? This is not the last time. Maybe to this degree, I'm hoping, but you never know. There's going to be a next crisis at some point. But in this time of crisis, now, do you adjust your pricing, Carl? Or like, what, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Okay. Yes. Well, and again, not, it, do you need to? Not necessarily. Once again, I would like to say there's this black and white roadmap I could lay out for you. This is about spidey senses and being intelligent. But here is something that I have been told by many coaches over the years, because I've been recommending this for a long time, that they would say something like, wow, that, that's close to magic. Like, that was unbelievable. Thank goodness I listened to you. In fact, one of my best friends um, literally spoke to him this weekend, and he was telling me that he used this exact strategy. It was in a roundabout way thanking me, which he'd already thanked me in the past about it, but he was thanking me again literally this weekend about it. Here's um, what I do. Let's say I'm a $2,000 a month co- coaching. I'm a $2,000 a month coach. Instead of starting, in ni- that should be 1997, by the way. Your pricing should always end with a seven. If you're listening to that right now and go, oh, that sounds cheesy. Look, it's just two grand. You're, you're wrong. End of story. Mic drop. The end. Um, your pricing ends with a seven if you want to increase your conversion. So you're not two grand a month. You're 1997. Um, but anyway, so I'm 1997, but I'm going to use two grand for math. Um, so what you do is like month one, because again, you, you've got this perfect story right now to be able to say, look, here's the way I'm going to frame it um, because I want to allow you to be able to get out of, you know, this situation. So I could start it. And again, you can use some whatever numbers you want. Let me just tell you, I would do what the answer, Road Dog, is you do whatever it takes. Take those three words, tattoo them on your arm, put them a post-it note on your forehead, put a post-it note on your computer, take a note and put it on your inside of your wallet. So every time you open it, you look at it, make it the password on your phone, make it the screenshot on your phone. What you do is those three words, whatever it takes. So what I do, Road Dog, I'm selling you coaching, right? And I'm two grand a month. Say, Road Dog, look, I understand, you know, like your restaurant's not going as well as what it otherwise could be. The curbside sales are pretty good. You know, you're you're doing all right, but you had to lay off a couple staff members and we are where we're at. Here's what I want to do, but I want to help you. And Road Dog, the most important thing is we have to make sure that we don't let this happen again. We need to put systems and processes in place, et cetera, to make sure that the next time it comes, we crush it. And not to mention in roughly 90 days when all this you know, it starts to turn around again, um, we are ready to rock and roll. So here's what I want to do for your road dog. I'm going to make month one, 400. I'm going to make month two, 800. Month three is going to be 1600. And then month four will be 1997. Like those are my fees. I'm 1997 a month. Um, so what I'm going to do though, I'm only going to get you started. So I'm going to give you four months to get to my full prices. Look, what do you, you know what I mean? And then I look at you and I'm, I'm listening for tonality. If I'm on the phone, I'm listening for tonality. Remember words are 7% of communication. The way you say it, the speed at which you say it, the pause on the phone after I throw it back to you. And the only way you get better at this is through experience. Okay. But again, you, you, when I'm, when I throw it to you, road dog, I'm not just listening to what you say, which is important, but the way you say it is a lot more important. Right. So then I'm listening to what you say. And if you said no to that, I would go 200, 400, 800, 16, 1997. If you said no to that, or and again, said no, couldn't decide, you want to speak to your wife, blah, 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 blah. You know, this is just objection handling. Do you understand an objection? It's like, it's not them saying no. Too many folks in coaching who aren't good salespeople, seasoned salespeople, confident salespeople, um, they let them off the hook big time topic for maybe another day. Normally, the reason for that is that you don't hire your own coach, so you don't really believe in it, so therefore you let them off the hook. So it's sympathy versus empathy. If you say to me, look, you can't afford it. I don't have sympathy. I have empathy. I understand where you're coming from, but I disagree vehemently. You know what I mean? Because I know that you can't afford not to have coaching, but I do whatever it takes to close the deal. That's it. Because I know Road Dog, once I shut, you know, I turn the phone, you know, I hang the phone up or I pack up my goodies and I leave. Once you lose the intensity of that moment, right, because there's a process that you go through, right? Like our coaches, we teach them how to use the software. It's called Profit Acceleration Software. And then after they go through it, the intensity of the moment when we get to the end of 
the consultation, you can't duplicate that. Like they're not going to go away, speak to their wife and then come back. She thinks it's an amazing idea. The wife A needs to be in that meeting, by the way, if she's going to be involved in the, in the decision-making process. But you've got to make sure um, that you understand that if you lose the intensity of that moment, you can't duplicate it. You can't like come back two weeks later and then re-go through the software and duplicate it. That's just not what happens. Um, so anyway, so the answer is you do whatever it takes. So yes, would, would I adjust my pricing? Yes. Um, and then how would I go about doing it? I just gave you an example. You can adjust those. You can go, you know, 500, 1,000, 1,500, and then 1,997, right? And again, you do it 497, 997, 1,497, and then 1,997, right? Your pricing always ends with a seven. So, so yes, I would do that. But again, even in incredible times, I would be willing with my coaching, and this is what my one of my best friends thanked me for over the weekend that I advised him to do. If you're not a good salesperson, what happens is if I'm a $2,000 a month coach and I suck at sales, I lower my fees to 1000 a month, right? That's stupidity. You just crushed the lifetime value of your client. You just turned a $24,000 coaching engagement into a $12,000 coaching engagement. Not a good idea, right? So what you do, rather than going from two grand down to a grand because you suck at sales, you just do the scaled pricing model. And now you have a $24,000 client, but you only had to sell them at, what did I say, 400 to get started. All right, follow? So, so that's what I would do. But the most important thing I want to take out of that is you do whatever it takes. That's the solution. Yeah. When, you're, when you're coaching your client, what do you do to keep them on board? Whatever it takes. You've got to get in a plane. You've got to get in a train. You've got to get in an automobile. Look, that's what, within reason, of course, you'd be a little bit intelligent here, like dependent upon the numbers and the distance and that sort of stuff. But I tell you, you know, you're a coaching client of mine back in the day. I got to tell you, man, it, it was very difficult for you to cancel. And the reason, and it's not because I was money hungry and I needed to make millions of dollars with my coaching. It was because like, I wasn't, I was doing you, if I was coaching you, Road Dog, I believe this in every cell in my body, I'm doing you the favor. Right, you're not doing me a favor by paying me two grand a month. I'm doing you a favor by donating my one hour a week, depending upon what the framework was, but I would normally do an hour a week for twelve weeks and then we go to every second week. But at the end of the day, if I'm coaching you, I'm doing you the favor, you're not doing me a favor, right? Because twenty four grand for what I would bring to the table is so undervalued, it's friggin' nuts on steroids. So and I believe that the psychology of that is part of the X factor. So I did whatever it takes. You were a coaching client of mine. I, if I had to get on three calls in a week, that's what I did. If I had to get in the car and drive around with you, your realtor did this many times. I get in the bloody car and drive around with them and watch them for a day or two. And then I would be able to go ping, 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 ping. Boom. They're like, oh my God. Right. But, but here's magic. If you think, oh my God, I can't get in a car with a freaking realtor. Um, for two days, like how could they possibly pay me enough to do that? And that would take me out of the office. Well, when I did it with one realtor, I was able to duplicate it. And now, like if you give me a realtor, I mean, I can change their life for you. Like, in, like yeah, if you introduce me to a realtor, I just change the person's life. Mic drop. And I don't say that arrogantly from a place of pumping my chest. I just say it because because I sat in the car with them, I know exactly what their existence is, and I can just tell them exactly how to go about ramping up. Um, this real estate practice, which, by the way, <laughs> coincidentally, one of the things I'd recommend is they go find a different career, um, because I believe um, real estate is a real tough gig. And if you're a realtor and you don't buy and sell your own real estate um, at an absolute minimum, build a brokerage. So you've got realtors underneath you. Operating as a retail um, realtor is a very difficult existence, um, in my opinion. Um, feel free to disagree, but that's what I'd say big time. But that's how I know because I did it. I did whatever it takes. So, so there you go, Road Dog. That's how to answer that, brother. I'd all, I'd, I'd also say patience. I, I would say that for everybody, think long term. Don't think you you know you need to charge two grand up front. Like, where are you going to be thirty, sixty, ninety days from now? Right? Like, you know, because the problem is, and I've seen it time and time again, it's guys will stay stuck and gals will stay stuck in the same spot ninety days from now when they could have just discounted their rate for a couple of months and then they'd be way, way, way further ahead. So, you know, I think that's just a, a pride, maybe an ego thing getting in the way. 
but that that's just personal uh, opinion there and that's why you know that close guess what it works but Carl you talked about JVs and because we had a question come in about that and people you know obviously talking to JV partners they're like man it's like I'm 90% closed with this with this JV and and now all of a sudden it's it's crickets so like what do you do in that especially now right like JVs right now could be the lifeblood for okay. any coaching practice so it's like you know you feel you're 90 percent there but they've sort of been maybe dodging you and it's been quick like what do you do just to like get them back on and get them closed yeah um okay can i it's, firstly here's the way if you look at your week um i'm going to talk just generally in a week you know during these crazy times you have to adjust all this stuff but if i look at your average week and you just break it up say you're working 50 hours a week I'd break it down into 25% of your week should be spent um, on um, joint venture partners, attracting them, servicing them, following up with them, getting them on the phone, getting face-to-face -face with them and assisting them. So 25% and then 75% on coaching clients to build. And that is a traditional coaching practice where you're, you know, one coach or maybe you've got one coach with you. Um, you know, just trying to get the 500,000 you're living that existence. So 25% of your week should be spent doing this. And if you're not spending that, that percentage of your week, which most of you aren't, you, you need to ramp this activity up because this is the game changer. This is how you go from like a hundred grand to a million joint ventures is the secret sauce in a very big and real way. Okay. Um, but they're 90% there. This is it. real simple. Just everybody listen to this. If you're listening to it on a, you can rewind it. Write down what I'm about to say because I promise you, especially during these crazy times, this is how you change the game with a joint venture partner. And my experience is that less than one in ten coaches get this right. And this is this is mic drop stuff. You need to walk in and become a solution to their problem. Okay. The attitude that most coaches have is they walk into, and again, I'm just going to use metaphorically the accountant. We just kind of automatically go there um, when we talk about um, joint ventures, but accountants can be challenging the best of times. I've never seen a category of people that are so, um, you know, okay with not showing up to your appointment and not emailing, not apologizing when you get them on the phone in 10 days. So, and that's not a shot at accountants. Lots of them are listening, got lots of them as clients. This is just a, it's a, it's a funny breed of folks, right? Highly, highly analytical. But here's the thing. Most people will approach the joint venture partner and they think like, again, what's the deal? Oh, I charge, um, a, just easy math. I charge a grand a month. So I'm going to give the joint venture partner 20%. So that would be 200. So that joint venture partner is going to get 200 bucks a month for the life of the agreement. I'm going to start paying the joint venture partner when they start paying me. And if they cancel and stop paying me, I'm going to stop paying the um, the joint venture partner at that stage, right? Well, I tell you, I got a six-year-old daughter, and she would be smart enough to create that offer, right? It's just, this is not going, on average, this is not going to juice anybody, and it most certainly is not going to get the attention of the accountant. Here's how you get the attention of the accountant. You become a solution to their number one problem. I don't need to meet the accountant, and I guarantee you this is going to lift up you know, his or her eyebrows, and this is going to solve a problem. Accountants once a year are so busy that they cannot keep up. And quite frankly, if you ask them, it is a total nightmare and it literally ages them to the point where, you know, they, they end up getting sick afterwards and they just, they can't come home for lunch. They are working, you know, 16 hours a day. Everything is, you know, red light emergency stuff with their clients because what happens is their business clients come to see them three months after the year is over and then go, you know, again, oh, I got to get my taxes in. I got to get my taxes in. I got to get my taxes in. Well, if you understand anything about accounting, you can't, once the numbers are in, the numbers are in. We can't fudge. We can't adjust because you've heard the expression, no doubt, creative accounting. Well, you want to allow your accountant to be able to do that. If you go to them three months after the year is over, there is no, you know, there's very little creativity that's able to happen. More to the point, the problem for the accountants is they're so damn busy during that time. Forget creativity. All they need to do is just push your numbers together, get it in, tell you how much tax you, um, they provide your tax return and they tell you how much tax you owe and on it goes. Okay. They hate that. That's not what an accountant wants to do. What an accountant actually was trained to do 
And what they want to do is to be able to help you with your business and pr- provide proper financials. And again, uh, to call a tax return financials, like, you know, I've got a coffee cup sitting on my desk. I could call that a hat, but that wouldn't make it true, right? Like, so calling your tax return financials is just stupidity at, you know, at, at breakneck speed. But anyway, so this is the challenge for the accountant. Okay, how do you solve that? Mr. Accountant, here's what I'm going to do. I want you to take me for a test drive. Write those words down, test drive. People love it, and it takes the pressure off, so they can send. What I mean by that, Mr. Accountant, send me three clients, and let's see. I'm here talking a pretty good game. Let's see if I'm for real or not, and I'll tell you how you can find out. Give me three clients and watch me perform. But here's what's going to happen with those three clients. They will come to see you at a minimum two times a year during the year, not when it's over, during the year, quite possibly four times a year, and depending upon the size of the business and the activity, up to 10 times a year, okay? And if I have to drive and pick them up and drive them to your office, that's what I will do. If I have to go to their office and do a three-way call with you so that they get this stuff in, that's what I will do with you. But I guarantee the three people that you send me at the end of the year, when you have that log jam and it's absolutely psychotic around here and you can't sleep and you have to get here super early and stay super late and it ages you and you hate it and it annoys the crap out of you, um, that's not going to happen with these three clients. And then, by the way, if you decide that you want to send me 10 clients, it won't be the case for the 10 clients either. But here's what's going to happen. I'm not going to pay you. You're not going to pay me. I keep my money. You keep your money. But when clients come to see you four times a year, you're going to be able to charge them significantly more than what you're now charging them. And by the way, you're actually going to be performing, you know, the tasks and the accounting that you actually want to do. And by the way, I would also like to participate in assisting you in how I think some magic can happen with that specific client, but it will depend on, you know, what it is they do, et cetera. But here's what I believe, Mr. Accountant, that a business has a scoreboard. And if I went to a sporting event and I wasn't allowed to see the scoreboard, it would be very difficult to follow the game borderline ridiculously boring, and I could almost guarantee that I wouldn't come back to the next game, because why would I? Because you need to be able to read the scoreboard to know what the hell is going on, and most certainly the teams playing need to be able to see the scoreboard so they know what they've got to do in the last two minutes of the half and the last two minutes of the game in order to get their team above the other, right? So, So you've got, and the better your scoreboard, okay, like think of football, you've got, it's not just about the scorer, it's like if you look at the Super Bowls over the last whatever number of years, 50 years, look at the number of turnovers, and you'll see that the team with the number of turnovers more often than not loses the game, the Super Bowl. And by the way, do playoffs, and it's like 90. If you go playoffs game, playoff games over the last 50 years in football, the team with the most turnovers lost a ridiculous percentage of the time to the tune of about 90%, right? Go check it out. Find out for yourself. But that's so that's a statistic that I'd like to be following. And by the way, if I get a running back who keeps dropping the bloody ball, <laughs> it's a playoff game. What do you think? I got to, first of all, put some stick him on his damn hand so he doesn't drop the ball. I got to talk to him before the game and say, look, bud, I know you're a destroyer out there. But when you drop the ball, we lose football games. So get it in your head, man, that rather than getting an extra yard or two, because when, when they do a fumble again, if you look at it, you'll see that it's a guy going for an extra yard. He's doing an extra little, you know, cute little turn for, you know, for his girlfriend in the stands or his wife in the stands. This is when the ball comes out. No, get your three yards down. Keep that ball safe as a priority. Like, you know, this is a conversation you have with your receivers and your running backs. Um, so anyway, so, um, so there you go. That's, um, that, that's how you do it. Oh, and then, okay, so this is an accountant. Now, an advertise, imagine we just, we have somebody, let's call him Bill, and he's an advertising salesperson. What is his challenge? People buy an ad, they run it for X, let's call it 90 days, three months, and then they say, yeah, you know, I got a couple calls, but they weren't very good. Nothing came of it. I'm going to press pause on this. I'll call you back in six months when I'm better prepared and I'll run the ad again, which of course, guess what? Never happens, conversation over. So I sit down with Bill, the advertising sales guy. I want to become a solution to his problem. This is what I was saying earlier. I want you to, this is the difference. You don't go, hey, Bill, I'm going to pay you 20% of everything you send me 
And by the way, you could do that. That's great. But that's not, this isn't what's going to lift up his eyebrows or her eyebrows. This isn't what's going to get those joint venture deals done that where you just crush it. Okay. And again, think of the opportunity right now to get these guys on the phone has never been better. So what I do is I sit down with Bill and I say, look, man, here's a scoop. There's no bigger fan of advertising than me, which by the way, it's true. If you know me, I, absolutely my truth. I believe that um, turning advertising into profit is a superpower. Like when you can do that, you go get your red cape and wear it all day because once you can do that, there is no limit to the size of company that you can build. End of story. Advertising to profit. But anyway, so I say that. So now he knows I'm a fan. And believe me, he has not heard this very often. He's like, oh, wow, cool. I got a fan here. Um, this is what I'm going to do, Bill. I want you to take me for a test drive. Remember those two words, right? When you don't, don't, like, what do most people do? They go for a joint venture and they're like, how many clients do you got? 700? Okay, perfect. Let's invite all 700. And in the back of their mind, they're thinking, I don't know this guy from a bar of soap. Like, can I trust him? Is he going to follow through? We've all been, you know, we've all seen the, the flashy sales guy in the flashy suit come and make a mess. So take me for a test drive. So Bill, here's what I want you to do. I want you to send me three of your advertisers. The commitment that I am going to make while I am coaching them, they will not cancel their ads to the absolute best of my ability. And I want you to test me. I want you to take me for a test drive. And if they run, my goal will be to double their advertising with you over the next 12 months. Remember, I'm the biggest fan of advertising ever. Okay. So if they're running a half page ad and it's X, it's two grand. I want to over my relationship over the next 12 months, my goal will not only to not have them cancel, but to have them double their advertising spend with you. But I'm here talking a good game. Bill, take me for a test drive. Send me 10 clients and let's see. Kaboom. Mic drop. And, and then you do it for, and then just think of every other niche. And I can tell you that the best five joint venture partners for you will be the chambers, accountants, business brokers, networking organizations, and advertising salespeople. So basically, those are the five niches you want to be um, you want to be attracting. You want to be talking to those folks, and kaboom! So so that's how you do it. So you're trying to get a joint venture. You're ninety here here road dog. Let me, I want to come back to the question. I believe it was something to the effect of they're ninety percent there, and it's not happening. Let me just tell you what is happening. They've approached the, again, metaphorically, the accountant. They've given him the whopping, amazing, game-changing, incredible value proposition that you send me clients. In other words, you do all the work, and then I'm going to pay you 20% of the action when they start paying me for as long as they start, as long as they pay me. And when they stop paying me, I'm going to stop paying you. I remember I said my six-year-old could come up with that one, right? And so they're there. And then you have also probably put the positioning of they've got 400 clients. Well, let's invite all 400 to X, Y, Z, right? Like this is why they're nervous. They're, app they're apprehensive. And then you get to a certain point and they're like, well, like I said, it sounds like a pretty good idea and they could use the extra cash. And a couple of their clients do need a little bit of help and are always asking them for help. And they don't really like, they don't offer it. It's not what we do, right? We're not, we're not consultants. We're not coaches around here. Like we don't, you know, do psychology and all that sort of stuff and, uh, you know, help with systems and marketing and sales. We, we do advertising. We do, you know, we're accountants. We do the books. So anyway, so there you go. And you just, you get it 90% of the way there. The accountant is, they're just apprehensive. And then they get a little bit squeamish. And what do people do when they get squeamish, a little bit nervous? It's easy just to not do anything. And this is why you find that they just, that they don't, they don't even reply. Like they just, don't reply. And it's not that they they haven't 100% ruled it out in their head. They've just in the, you know what I mean? In their mind, they're just like, they just can't quite get there, which is exactly why you got it roughly 90. I'd say about 80% would be more likely, but you get it 80% of the way there. Um, and the question it's 90%, but the last 10 and it's not happening, right? Like the accountant doesn't wake up one day and go, Oh my gosh, you know what? I'm going to reply to that email. Um, we're going to get this joint venture going. That, that's not what happens. It's it's dead. It's when they go silent, you know, pretty much it's uh, it's game over. So there's the uh, there's the solution, Road Dog. That's how I do it, and that's how coaches can crush it. And during these turbulent times, like even so, like if you work with us, one of the things we have, like we build online business academy and membership sites for everyone. Well, on those websites, 
um, we have got a link for the five joint venture partners that I just described. So say you meet an accountant, you literally send them to your website, and then there's a video specifically for an accountant. And then there's another link, which is a video specifically for somebody selling advertising. And then there's another video that's specific to the chamber. And then there's another one specific to the networking um, groups, et cetera. So you could imagine that we, you know, we're talking their language, which the videos are ridiculously similar. Because at the end of the day, we're doing the same, you know, strictly speaking, we're doing the same for all of them. But the, the X factor is that there's a problem that they have that we need to solve that is unique to each five of the niches. You get on the phone, you explain it, take me for a trust drive and crush it. Well, there you go. You can uh, you can take a breath now, my friend. Um, <laughs> just for a second, though, because here's yeah. here's what I'm going to sort of reframe this question here. Because I, I just think again, people right now, times are tough. Money's getting tighter. If if you were a coach, right, like you're just getting started, where would you spend your money? If I'm a coach just getting started, where would I spend my money? Um, okay, well, I, I can answer this question differently. I think it would be help, more helpful. I don't care what kind of business I'm starting. I will always spend my money in the exact same place. And before I answer it, I'm going to tell you where I won't spend my money. I'm not going to spend it on branding, okay? Just uh, you know, making everything look pretty and the perfect logo and the perfect this. And, yes, you should do I literally over the weekend – um, you know, putting together logos, et cetera. This is something you should take the time to do. Is this a priority? Is this like what you do at the beginning? And again, actually, I don't want to say that you shouldn't make your business look cool and make it look, you know what I mean, bigger than what it possibly is because you're just getting going. I mean, why wouldn't you make it look okay? Is this where you spend your time? Is this, is, if you have a limited number of amount of resources and whatnot, is this where you're spending it on your business cards, your website, and the logo? Please, Lord, no. Um, do not do that in any way. But but here's the answer. Um, in fact, I've actually put this up on my um, Facebook page multiple times over the years. But if I had $100,000 and I was starting a company, what would I do? Or in fact, I normally frame it up. If you had $100,000 to build a company, where would you spend the money? And always interested to see what people say. And by the way, some people have some great answers. Um, but with 100% certainty, what I would do is I do what's called buying coach. Well, you asked me about a coaching company, so I buy coaching clients. Actually, no, I got to rephrase that. I buy ideal coaching clients. So in other words, um, there's a good coaching client and a bad coaching client. Um, how would I um, adjust the two? So number one, if they are actively out there promoting their business, so that's somebody advertising heavily, this, this guy, gal, gets a star. Okay, because they're trying to build their business right now, right? Um, so this is an ideal coaching client. Um, unit of sale, um, an ideal client. I, I, I don't want to go – the massage therapist on average, and of course depending upon the size and the experience, um, a massage therapist, just simple numbers. Let's say they charge 100 bucks for a massage. Well, if I'm two grand a month, they've got to do 20 massages to break even on my coaching fees, right? So, like, this is not the kind of client that I want to be going with. This is not a client that's going to be around for three years. And I'm looking, I, my ideal coaching clients are folks that stay for years. At 90-day point, I don't want to have that automatic conversation where they're feeling overwhelmed, not keeping up, and they want to cancel. Like, so, maybe you're wondering if you're getting that all the time, you're not dealing with ideal clients on average, right? Um, so that, and then also, by the way, a third thing, again, just now I'm kind of going into a niching conversation, but the other thing is your expert, you know, your expertise, your passion, and your experience. So I want to work with clients who I have experience with, right? So that's an ideal coaching client. And these are the ones that I want to buy. So I'm not going to buy the massage therapist on average. Um, and again, there's always some gray matter there that you should factor in, but you'd have a hell of a time convincing me that the massage therapist is the right ideal coaching client for you at two grand a month and to keep them for years. If you're just starting, again, that this conversation adjusts ever so slightly. Um, but you're getting cranking, so I buy coaching clients. Um, so, like again, a roofing company, okay? An example, on average, they charge, let's say, 10 grand to jump on your roof and fix it. So let's assume that there's going to be five grand of jam there, like $5,000 of profit. 
on the ten thousand dollar roof. Well, this is a good coaching client, right? Because I just gotta I gotta help him get five clients in a twelve month period. If he's got five thousand dollars of profit per job, roughly, I gotta help you get five clients a year to break even. I gotta help you get ten clients to double your money. Well, this is an ideal coaching client. This is somebody who could stick around for a very very long time. And I don't find constantly find myself in that conversation where they're where they're battling. So anyway, so I buy coaching clients. And what do I mean by that? Well, actually, the example that we gave earlier, part of how I would buy a coaching client is if I'm two grand a month and I do it five hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred, and then two grand a month for my coaching. I just worked for you know five hundred month one, a grand fifteen hundred for three months. I'm losing a lot of money. So that's an example of how I'm buying the client, right? Because I 500 bucks, like this is not enough to build any kind of a real business. So that would be an example. Um, another example is where um, I'll go to an accountant. I'll go to, you know, the girls that are selling the memberships at the chamber, the advertising salespeople, or the guy who owns the magazine. And I say something to the effect of, well, look, when I close, like when you send me a coaching client, I pay like I'm two grand a month. I'm twenty four grand a year. I will pay a two thousand dollar referral fee. Well, what I do and how I'm very different from other coaches that I met over the years. Well, if you, K Road Dog, it's you and you are the guy selling advertising. You own the magazine. Well, I come in. We discuss this. Think of our conversation earlier with getting the the joint venture partner to eighty to ninety percent. Well, Road Dog, I get you to agree. Right. Say we're face to face. I shake hands. If we're over the phone, I'm like, OK, man, so I got your word, especially on a Zoom call and that sort of stuff. A conversation like this um, will be handy where you're kind of looking into one another's eyes and it's ready to rock. But let's say we're face to face. We shake hands. When the deal is done, I say, look, Road Dog, well, how I want to do this a little bit differently than the way a lot of people do. I'm going to pay you up front the two grand for the first referral because you told me you're going to take me for a test drive and send me three. Well, look, I want to pay you two grand right now to get this started, right? Let's rock. And by the way, if you bundle that with what I said earlier in terms of, um, you know, solving his number one problem, and then you whip out two grand, because now it's not a referral fee. See, now now it's advertising, right? Like, again, I've done that, like, with, with accountants. I'll say, well, look, I want to pay you this fee, but I don't want to do it um, in referral fees, because that, again, it can be a conflict of interest, and they get, you know, they get, um, squeamish about it. So I just say, well, look, what I want to do is I want to pay you advertising and I want you to mention me on your website. Um, so instead of accepting referral fee, now it's advertising. And I just want you to put my logo and I don't care if you put it at the you know 19th page where no one's ever going to find it. What we're really doing here is you're sending me three coaching clients to get this relationship done. But what I've done is I've paid a thousand dollars up front. Like that's an example of buying coaching clients. So a few other ways of doing it. I could also, I could coach you for free road dog for the first 30 days, lose money, prove my worth. This is a way of buying you as a client, but you do know at X date, X fees kick in and we start to rock and roll. But I've gone in, I've, by donating my time, I'm effectively buying you as a client. And then in 30 days, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't live without this guy. So, so anyway, so that's my answer buying coaching clients. So, and if you reframe it, well, actually, I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole here, but the bottom line, guys, you got to, it comes back to whatever it takes to a certain degree, right? But like, and if it involves whipping a few bucks out of your pocket in order to get that relationship started, like, again, where I was going to go, but I'll just lay this. Here's what I have done. Some folks are totally comfortable with this. Some folks love it. Some folks don't. Frankly, I don't really care. It's up to you. I know what I'm comfortable with. You decide what you're comfortable with. But the girls at the chamber are making approximately 30 grand a year. Okay. I always, I pull them out of the chamber. I just feel like that's the right thing to do because I don't want to do this deal inside the chamber. Again, if you're a male, you know, like a, you know, a 45 year old male, and then she's a 25 year old um, youngsters, you got to be a little bit careful. Like it looks like you're hitting on her to do, to do, to do, to use your spidey senses. But again, I want to get her off premises and I want to talk about, look, forming relationships. Some of what I do, I want to show you my software, how we crush it. I'll find any business owner a hundred thousand dollars in 45 minutes without them spending a dollar on marketing or advertising to do, to do, to do. Well, I sit down with her and this is where 
when you whip out, because she's in the coal face. She's dealing with the business owner. She's speaking to the business owners. Well, when I whip out the two grand, the one grand, the 500 bucks, the 250 bucks, right? Whatever you pull out, the more, obviously, the more impact it tends to have. That's, again, very gray. Um, but you can get her attention very, very quickly, and you can find yourself with a solid, you know, 10 to 12 referrals very, very quickly. Because the gal at the chamber is answering questions about marketing, sales. Like, why do people buy memberships at the chamber? It's not to be a part of the chamber. It's because they think it's a solution to grow their business. But they're that lost, they're that stupid, they're that clueless that they think somehow getting their name on the chamber website is actually going to do something, right? Like, bad news, and eh, that's not what's about to happen. But the gal at the chamber is in the coal face dealing with these folks. She says, look, off the, however she words it, right? And again, it's, whether it's the wrong thing to do, again, I, I'm not going to have that conversation right now. I think we've talked about it at different times, Road Dog, on the podcast. You guys have to do whatever you feel comfortable with. But I can tell you that she's in the coal face making stuff all money, ask, having business owners ask her, can you help me do X? And then I'll let you decide whether or not the gal making 25 grand at the chamber should be answering sales and marketing questions for these companies doing you know, 750, a million, 1.5, $2 million a year. Okay, you answer that for yourself. She refers them to you. And I just, I, and again, I have an envelope, you know, I got an envelope in my pocket and I slip it across the table and I go, here you go. And if then of course there's a conflict of interest. So what the hell, let's answer that. I just say to her, I say, look, if you want, cause I, I, I want to, the chairman of the board at the chamber if you try to go through the normal channels, which by the way, I have done and it is possible um, and that's fine. Um, but normally you're going to find there's an enormous amount of red tape. It's a nonprofit and it's just a headache and you're getting nowhere. You talk about getting to 80 to 90% and never getting there. Well, I think you'll find that that exercise of trying to get a formal relationship with the chamber will be there. So I go directly to the gal at the chamber and I have found that I've had tremendously, you know, more success there. So I just say to her, Look, if you want to tell the chamber about this relationship, you are free to do so. I've got a private company. I can do whatever the hell I want. I can hand whoever I want money, right? But if you don't want to tell anybody at the chamber or your colleagues or whoever, don't. But I can tell you that I am, you know, I'm sworn to secrecy here and they are never going to hear it from me. And if they ever ask me, I'm going to say, well, you'd have to look. Lucy and I have spoken multiple times and I'm going to. You know, let you speak to which they're never going to ask, by the way. So it's not really a problem. But I just want to I want to handle that conflict of interest thing that I know folks hear that and then go, is that the right thing to do? Whatever it is. So so Road Dog, I buy clients as a way to start a business. End of story. Hey, just real quick before we do a quick wrap, um, a couple things just for clarity's sake. And I think it's really important. Um, the five best um, niches real quick. They are. Accountants, chambers, networking organizations, advertising salespeople, and business brokers. Beautiful. And um, now you'd also said when it comes to planning your week, 25% of your time on JVs, 75%? Clients. Beauty. You're actually okay. working with clients. You're actively recruiting clients. You're converting clients. Like you're, you're working on the coaching clients, 75%. Joint ventures, 25%. And that's a... That's a one man, two man coaching practice, you know, approaching 500 grand and trying to get to there. All right, my friend, you are a registered beautician. I thank you. Any final words from the man at the top of the hill? <laughs> what I think um, the three words, whatever it takes during these turbulent times. Look, there's some, look you're going to take one of two approaches here. You've got, you know, you take your head and you shove it into the sand or you get ultra aggressive. And those of you that get ultra aggressive, and I can tell you like internally here, like we got our foot on the gas pedal big time. Um, you, you get ultra aggressive. You remember the, you know, instant gratification thing. Be careful with that. You will win in like 90 days, six months, and potentially for the rest of your life. Cause again, your rest of your coaching career, cause remember a couple of joint venture partners can just literally set you up. End of story. So this is what you should, um, this is what you should be doing. You should be ultra aggressive, but you got to do whatever, like right now, whatever it takes is about 10 times harder 
than it was 30 days ago or wh- whatever the number, you know, like whatever it was ago, right? Before this craziness happened, um, it was a lot easier to be aggressive and manage your psychology before this. But the strong survive. And if you want to, in fact, you know what? I'm just wrote down before we end. I wrote an email about this not long ago. Here's what's happening and take it to the bank. 25% of the restaurants don't deserve to be here and they are going. 25% of the coffee shops don't deserve to be here and they are going. 25% of the builders shouldn't be permitted to build a tree house. They are going. 25% of every niche are going. 25% of the business coaches are going. Okay? So manage your psychology. Be one of the 75. Do you think when there's only 75% of coaches, and by the way, there is about to be a boom in the business coaching industry, mark your words on that one. Disrupted people buy. And I don't know if I've ever seen, like, has there ever been more disrupted people? Like, we're literally locked inside our friggin' doors right now. Like, it's crazy. Um, never has there been people disrupted like they are right now. Um, coaching, like I said, a lot of our coaches, true story, not hyperbole, nothing. They're telling me they're either scrambling or busier than they have ever been. I don't need to tell you which category is which, but all I can say is be aggressive, do whatever it takes, manage your own psychology, be kind to yourself. Also, you, you don't think that I have spent, even over this weekend, a few minutes, you know, with my head in my hands just going, what the hell is happening, right? Like, we're locked inside, you know, like my daughter, she goes out to, like, you know, she's going out on the street and then my wife's all worried that, you know, should she be on the street on her bike? You know what I mean? Like crazy stuff like that. Um, you get it. So, so again, just be kind to yourself and don't, you know, a little bit of uncertainty in these turbulent times. If they got you down a little bit, that's totally okay. But manage your psychology and turn it around real quick. You're allowed to get down. You're just not allowed to stay there. Um, and actually, very importantly, guys, in this, like, again, there are some people hurting. And this is the time to go and give and serve at the absolute highest level. And yes, in some cases, you're going to get paid, but it's, it's so much bigger than that, the picture. Um, and if you want to feel good, a very quick way of, of doing that is to go and serve, help, um, you know, contribution. Um, so let's not take it. We're coaches, right? We're coaches for a reason. We're the folks that go out and give and help. Um, make sure that you're, uh, you're doing that at the highest level right now, bro. But whatever it takes is the way I want to end this, brother. Beautiful. All right, everybody, again, thanks for tuning in to another fantastic episode of Business Coaching Secrets with my boy, King Carl. And again, if you want more information on how to build your coaching company, go to Focused.com, which is about to have a sexy new makeover by the sounds of it. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it. Anybody that's an existing coach, someone you think would make a great coach, a fan of Tony Robbins, or maybe a brand new Tampa Buccaneers fan, just like Carl, um, feel free to forward that to them as well. And of course, as always, we'd appreciate your, uh, your rating of the episode as well, as we all know that all of these iTunes and things like that, they put an insane amount of weight towards the reviews. So that's it, everybody. Please leave a review. And um, remember, everybody, progress equals happiness. Carl Bryan built Profit Acceleration Software 2.0 to train business coaches how to find any small business owner more than $100,000 in 45 minutes without them spending an extra dollar on marketing or advertising. This becomes a business coach's superpower. So as a business coach, you'll never again have to worry about working with business owners that can't afford your high-end coaching fees. Check us out at Focused.com.